Good morning, and thank you for investing your time with us um, here today. Uh, my name is Nicholas Johnson. I'm the CEO of Economists Without Borders and also the Managing Director of the Waterview Group. And I'm joined here by Marios F. Thimiopoulos, um, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Strategy International, calling in from Cyprus. Um, and we also have Elias Lee, who is the Founder and Chief Executive Officer of um, Philan, calling in from the USA. Uh, so the topic of today's panel session is addressing global economic friction post-COVID. And um, anyone who has any business interests which involve um, supply chains uh, in Asia uh, will be acutely aware of the impacts these have had um, over the last 12, 18 months. Um, we've seen rising shipping rates. We've had um, increased um, lag times and um, lead times. Uh, there's been unreliability. Um, a whole host of other issues associated with that. And, you know, we, we export a fair bit of products and are involved in that. So I can say personally we've been affected. Um, but broadly speaking, we're really interested to know what are the, what are the solutions? How can we move beyond this um, post-COVID? And to what extent has COVID been the cause of this versus other ongoing issues? So I'm really looking forward to this um, great conversation here today. Um, so I'm going to begin by just letting the panellists that we have here introduce themselves, and then we'll um, move on to a series of interactive questions, and towards the end, we'll get a bit of audience participation as well. So, um, uh, Elias, would you like to introduce a little bit about yourself and um, your interests on this topic of today's panel? Sure. Uh, my name is Elias Lee. I am the founder and CEO of Fillin. Fillin is a on-demand mobile platform that enables local service-based businesses like restaurants to pre-sell and monetize their time with dynamic pricing. So what we've seen with COVID is that it's hit local communities really hard, especially in the service industry like restaurants. And I think global supply chains are going to be squeezed and uh, having problems for not just the short term, but I think the long term until uh, I think we really look at our economies in a different way. Um, I think that being local and hyper-local and supporting local economies is, is going to be more important going forward. I know lots of international countries don't maybe have the resources to source locally for everything, but there are things that I think if more money was pumped into the local economies, um, there would be a better base if we wouldn't have so much supply problems. and different countries are going to have to deal with the rising cost uh, regardless of being able to get it from across the world. Um, I think that moving forward, the world, you know, in, in terms of a global economy, you can't think of the cheapest place you can get any sort of resource. That's that's not a sustainable uh, answer for anything, especially with, with the world the way it is. Uh, we're going to have to look at where we can source locally where we can support the local economies. And for knowledge work, you probably can source you know, anywhere in the world because it's digital. But anything that has a physical component, like food, like a service, like shipping, like logistics, that's gotta be done more locally. And, and I think technology can change that algorithm. That's, that's all we're trying to do. Fantastic. And Maris, would you like to introduce this, yourself and a little bit about your interest in the topic? Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, first of all, good morning. I'm actually in Dubai at this point. So uh, good morning from you. And I hope, uh, especially for Elias, that you have had a very nice Thanksgiving and uh, all the rest of, of the people following us. Um, as, as as Nicholas presented me, my name is Mario of I'm the, the, the CEO of Strategy International based out of Cyprus. Um, and basically today I'm going to have the opportunity to discuss a bit also about the global chain and all these uh, changes, if you want, that are taking place lately. Um, one of the things that will be quite clear to say is that it seems that we've been having, um, if you want, a competition um, being involved in the latest years um, with regards to the supply uh, chain and who basically controls what with regards to global trade wars. Uh, something that has been pumped up, if you want, because of COVID and because of the lack of resources, and because of or 
or because of the need of major resources that have been taking place throughout this period of time. One of the things that are very clear is that the supply chain issue will not really stop um, uh, quite soon. And one of the things that we've been seeing, we've been seeing very, very hard elements one, you know, taking place in Asia, um, and the challenges are really big. On the one hand, you have economies with high level inflation, you don't have a new job still, you still have the global pandemic, which is still hitting hard, and you have the strains of the pandemic that, you know, that hits hard, and now you have seasonal um, cases such as Christmas coming. And I've been reading actually an article earlier, uh, for example, stating what Amazon or Ikea are going to do uh, as companies considering for the need to provide their clients with goods at the same time uh, as they must deliver considering their um, uh, their products. So it seems that their profits are going to go lower because their high, their high level of risk decisions are so high that it's going to cost no less than $4 billion dollars and as it's per company, considering the, the choice that they're going to have. I think we're going to have the opportunity to talk more, Nicholas, uh, while the duration of our, of our speech. So basically, this is what I want to say to, to start with, if you want, the, the conversation. Thank you. Hmm. Um, so I guess I'll start with a series of questions to throw to the, the three of us, and we can discuss these in turn. Um, First of all, to what extent do you think that the disruptions we see in supply chains coming out of Asia currently are the cause of COVID-19 versus um, the combination of a whole bunch of fundamental changes which have been occurring for the last five or ten years? Uh, that, that's the, I go first or Elias? Yeah, I'll just jump yeah, in. Okay. okay. Well, my, 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 my suggestion is if you want, my, my research with regards to this issue would say that it's a combination of various elements that really take place at the same time. One is consumption. The consumption is increasing. Uh, the needs of consumption is increasing. Two, scarcity of resources. Um, three, um, prices. Because of global trade wars, things that we've been seeing during the presidency of Donald Trump and the, the fight that he's been having with China and China, trying to um, reconsider if you want its, its global posture with regard to global supply chain. Um, and also if you want the the landscape that actually was created during and after the global pandemic where e-commerce actually boosted up, digital currency boosted up, anything digital boosted up, including also the will for more goods to be spent, um, let's say within um, within a household and the needs that people have, including also the new generation that actually started to grow up in a digitized environment. So we are looking at an overall change of a global market understanding. Therefore, the ecosystem of the market itself in relation to how my job looks like, how my life looks like, how the community's life look, looks like, and therefore that would be a challenge with regards to more requests for more goods. I think the fact that the basically the earth stopped for about three months created also a very big problem with consideration to the movement of goods. And that movement of goods is actually evident considering the transport expenses that you actually see in various ports if you want to transport some goods. I'm actually at the stage where I'm living this, uh, this challenge and I have to choose basically air cargo to be cheaper than both cargo. And it says a lot about the living habits of airline companies, uh, which actually make money out of cargo, out of cargo but not actually people. Um, and that says a lot about how the future of cargo looks like. At the same time, the pace, the pace of, of time, the necessity of having the good next day delivery, like it's a courier, if you remember FedEx, used to advertise like this itself for many, many years that we delivered to you the next day, or UPS, um, suddenly actually became a reality for all companies. So while reading, I, I saw the choices of IKEA, uh, as I said earlier, uh, and Amazon to actually recruit their own boats, to actually pay for their own boats, to pay for their own airplanes, to actually get, uh, according to uh, articles, 
uh, seasonal people for about 150,000 people to deliver Amazon goods during uh, the festivity season, if you want, between um, uh, Thanksgiving and, and Christmas, New Year's period, in order to make sure that they become greater partners. Now, uh, and I think I'll, I'll say one, one more thing that, you know, to just make sure that um, I give enough time also to Elias. But um, one of the most important things that we will see also after this competition takes place is that conglomerates or corporations will become so vividly different than every other company that competition will not be able to, to be contained. Anybody who will have an average e-commerce uh, element, unless they actually invest into their national area and community, they will not be able to survive the competition of those corporations that are already investing in that technology hub in order to be the number one globally. And, you know, having said that, I'm in Dubai at this point, it was quite evident when Amazon bought companies like uh, like soup.com, which was one of the big e-commerce companies, in order to have a locality um, within the community itself. So I'll leave it to that, and I'll just pass the floor to you. Thank you. Um, I think that COVID definitely showed the cracks in the supply chain, global supply chain. I think COVID accelerated the problem and exacerbated it. It's kind of like remote working. A lot of people wanted remote working. Corporates then really weren't interested in having remote working. But once COVID accelerated that and people were forced to work remotely, um, I think there was a change in, in, in the way people looked at remote working. And I don't know for sure, but I think global, global supply chains are actually gonna get worse. I don't think that we're gonna have less business like COVID, or if anything, we're gonna have more, there's more population density, there's more population growth. So I, I don't see that the future it's going to get less. It's 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 probably going to have more problems. But if we look at sourcing locally and look at maybe not relying on global supply and just local supply and, and source where you have to, not where you um, want to. I think a lot of you know. I know in America we're we're very spoiled where we basically buy anything from anywhere we want, and that's fine but it comes at a huge cost to, to the entire world, really, in, in terms of uh, in the environment and the economies. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of people who want random toys from China and it's, they're sitting on some truck or some you know container load out in the port of Los Angeles and it's gonna be there for four months or something. That's something that we don't necessarily have to have. We don't necessarily have to have that random toy from China. You could probably source it locally from some toy maker here in America. Same thing with China. If they did, if they did more sourcing of their own stuff into China and, and India and then everything else, you wouldn't have as much of a global supply problem. But I think, as Mario said, um, the large corporates have a completely different agenda. They are just after the bottom dollar. And I think <clears throat> until they start to look at their business differently and truly look at it as a as a what's called an economics of mutuality, I, I don't think that this is going to go away anytime soon. So until I think until we really truly come together as just to, to make a better society and not just to you know enrich my shareholders, I don't I don't think that's going to happen. Mm. Yeah, some fantastic thoughts there. Um, yeah, because we um, we um, have a number of suppliers in China that we, we import um, parts and bits from. And um, uh, the increased cost associated with, with that import process has definitely caused us to think about um, alternatives. And I, I, I can very easily imagine that there is a pro increasing pressure on a lot of companies to rethink whether they look for those alternative suppliers um, onshore. So... I think this is going to be a distortionary effect there for sure moving forward. Um, Actually, Nicholas, one of the things that we we, we what we kind of missed to say is that the legal elements that actually come with attached in order to import goods has also changed. 
And also customs policies have also changed. Uh, so it's not only that we had the problem of it, but really customs elements have also changed considering the bilateral or multilateral approaches or alliances that countries have been doing throughout these years and especially during COVID in order to make sure that there is, you know, complementarity of goods um, on, on every single level. Um, secondly, uh, one of the things that we've discussed again with the Lions is the importance of the national economy itself and how important the national economy becomes considering, um, if you want, the, the needs of what the local economy requires. And during COVID-19, it wasn't that they were requiring a good that was coming from China or from Malaysia, let's say, but they were requiring parts of that good that was probably assembled in their own respective area or region that delayed it by itself. So the logistics that come with, considering what is the primary source, the secondary source, and also the transport source, therefore the logistics, therefore the uh, you know incoming to the country, the customs, the tariffs that were implemented, it really became quite difficult. A very good example is the UK, where at the same time where it exited the European Union, it, it applied tariffs for goods coming in and out of the country, which is an extra problem that was already, uh, you know, coming, if you want, with the exit, with the Brexit that you all know. Um, so it's not it's not only COVID-19, but rather COVID-19 put things into perspective. And as Elias said, it's not going to finish real time soon. And therefore, we need to find other measures and probably what now, uh, you know, Amazon or Ikea are doing uh, by, by, by basically either renting or buying the, the services of, of third parties will actually be the new uh, reality. The very big question is how do port authorities going to operate on those elements, considering that port authority gaming is actually on. You've been seeing large conglomerates from around the world, like DP World, for example, uh, buying ports left and right. And you have Costco buying ports left and right. And actually what they're going to offer is an all-inclusive service. So if you go from on Costco, let's say from Hong Kong, um, to Singapore, from Singapore to Europe, and you name it, in, in the port of Athens and Paris, maybe they will be able to offer uh, the X amount of services. Whereas DP World would go through Dubai, it will go, let's say, to, um, to, to Cyprus or the port of Haifa in Israel or go on and on. And, and there will be like a, a chain of, of new services that will be an all-inclusive chain. For that reason, you will have to pay. The alternative is you would pay higher price by doing air cargo. It would be faster, but it will not be survivable for an SME. Hmm. And just on that point about air cargo, to pick up something you mentioned earlier, um, one of the reasons why airlines have actually been more, more profitable with the um, air cargo recently, as opposed to shipping passengers, is because a lot of the air cargo, at least in Australia, and I assume it's similar uh, around the world. Uh, in Australia, the government has been subsidizing the, um, the, the air cargo flights. Uh, so that's yeah. been a source of profit for, for the airlines. And, and don't um, forget the fuel economy for that transport, by the way. Yeah? Uh, no wonder, for example, Virgin Galactic is trying to, to get like a good to, to fly in a, in a higher stratosphere level that will actually deliver the goods in, in lesser cost. Yeah. And so somebody who, who's a pilot will actually tell you that the higher you go, um, the less cursing you might spend. Uh, yeah. well, well, even time becomes even more profitable for that. So against us, we have COVID, we have time, we have um, corporate uh, competition, while at the same time you have a locality which does not exist, a uh, local economy that does no longer exist, considering... The, the global perspectives. And I think Elias can also tell us a, a, a few more things with regards to the U.S., which he, he correctly put, it's a consuming, uh, it's a very high-level consuming um, country, the United States. I mean, uh, it's about 25%, I think, of the national consumption of GDP uh, in the world. So, Well, and if you look at large corporates like Amazon, they have already basically built their own direct supply chain into China. They have their own cargo ships. They have their own planes. They have their direct suppliers from their suppliers in China. So they can actually skip 
a lot of the supply chain that normally people would have having to you know put it on a ship and or do air cargo they have their own ships they have their own planes they don't need a third party uh company where they do need a third party as as mario said they hired local workers to deliver the last mile the last mile delivery is actually the most costly for them and that's where the local economies of scale um i mean they don't pay i mean they pay their people okay but it's not putting it back into the local economy it's basically you know local labor to distribute their goods and so in an event like covid i mean look at amazon prices they have more than doubled in you know their stock price has more than doubled in the time of covid so for large corporations that have all their supply chain locked up they're going to really accelerate and the ones like mario said the smaller players they're really not even in any sort of shape to, to compete and that's i think that'd be a huge problem going forward because nobody wants to live in a world where it's just amazon and ikea operating everywhere that's not that doesn't make for a healthy economy that doesn't make for a healthy global economy it doesn't make for a healthy anything and i think i think that's why the competition of um uh, you know the, the 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 community if you want competition laws within the european union actually gives uh, this opportunity to smes to develop if you want in the european union area because they understand the competition is really not not in existence you can't compete with so huge companies which are you know amazon is one of the most uh, you know precious if you want companies around the world at this stage um, so in order to boost competition, you, you need to have, you know, you need to boost the local market, but the local market itself needs to be able to produce the goods with its own abilities that it, it does not have or may not have at this stage. Uh, imagine that you're an island, for example, uh, an island in the Caribbean, let's say next to the United States, for example, how much would the cost of delivery would be? How much the, the time, when, when would the time be? And also, how much the cost to import that good from uh, from let's say the United States, which is next door. So imagine if I would deliver this good on the other side of the earth, uh, let's say in Asia. And, and in Asia, although you have the complementarity of all these goods, and so you you have plentifulness of all these goods, especially when it comes down to technology goods or technology associated goods. Uh, how much would it be if you're still on an island? Uh, but they're not really close to the decision-making places or the production places, let's say, Shenzhen in, in, uh, in, in China. Uh, how much would this cost? What would this cost mean? Where will it be delivered? Uh, where, how, what, what quality are we talking about? There's also this, um, this question of quality. Uh, you would see a lot, of, a lot of goods are, you know, running out in the market, but the, the goods, the quality of the goods is not really good. So we, we have put the quality down and we have increased quantity because demand is higher. Um, but then again, we cannot offer it with our own, you know, plain hands in our own community because we don't have the capacity due to the fact that we're very globalized as economies and interrelated and interconnected with each other, whether we like it or not. Just on that point, Ned picked it up. Um, I'd like to throw out a question on risk management. So... Back in March, we saw the um, huge problems that were caused when the Ever Given um, blocked the Suez Canal for a period of time. Yep. Uh, what, what can businesses do to manage their risks uh, in the supply chain against these, you know, unforeseeable but um, problematic events uh, which occur at certain choke points in the global supply chain? Elias, you want to pick it up on this one first? I mean... I think they're all scrambling now to find different places to, to source their supply. Um, it's one of those things, right? Nobody cares until there's a crisis and then they care. So um, COVID is actually a wake-up call to a lot of places, a lot of local businesses, a lot of even large businesses. They have to completely change up their model, look at where they're sourcing, look at their lead times. Um, I, I still believe that a lot of items and a lot of resources could be sourced locally and i think not everything could be sourced locally obviously clearly but i think they don't try hard enough i think they're always looking for the cheapest labor the cheapest volume the cheapest prices and i just i don't think that's sustainable 
in in countries that are wealthier, like America, like you know the Middle East, like some parts of Asia, they have plenty of money. The money supply is not the problem. It's how are they applying that money and where are they getting their supply from? They're choosing corporate profits over the benefit of everything else. And I think that has to change before anything else can actually change. So is there a way to, to kind of mitigate that risk? Yeah, you have to find more suppliers locally that you're not gonna have a problem. It's like somebody said, if I can source all my stuff from three hours away and a guy in a truck, I can probably find another guy on a truck to drive it to me. But if I have to source it from China and it's got to hit, you know, three ports and, and four containers, the chances of it coming to me are very, very low. It's, it's, it doesn't, I mean, any one thing that happens and you're going to have a problem. So I think you guys need to look at locally. Um, I, I think, I think that, you know, if we want to put into perspective how much the cost was on, on a direct um, cost within, with regard to Suez Canal company, it cost them about $2.5 billion of losses uh, in, in one week. Um, number two, I think the Middle Eastern countries, uh, they didn't get in a state of panic considering the, the goods. However, um, some stocks did really change hands during that period of time considering the, the ability of goods to circulate either by boat or find alternative routes like through Africa, through the south of Africa. Um, and the third, the, the, the second element was to utilize higher air cargo. And the, 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 the third option was and still is, and it's actually taking place in the Gulf region, if you want, a high level increased investment in infrastructure on trains. And actually, uh, very, very big investors and people were wondering why they were selling their airline stocks and they were buying train uh, uh, train stocks suddenly it was not making sense, but rather actually now it does. So it seems we are going for a road uh, and, and rail, if you want beltway, I'm not, I'm not talking about the, the, the Chinese policy, but it actually makes sense where there is a connection of rails around the world. In fact, um, there is a railway which has been connected from China so far to the port of Istanbul um, in, in Turkey at this point. And actually, uh, it's, it's making a, a more profitable option, if you want, for those that would like to get goods which are not necessarily um, uh, can be thrown in the, in the direct market, but actually are goods that may come up. So while you have air cargo utilizing the opportunity for next day delivery, you will be using boats or trains on a higher speed than what it is today um, for medium term goods. That being said, uh, the Malacca Straits, for example, in Asia also have similar problems where you know you have accidents daily and where you, where you have a major accident, then it becomes difficult for the transit routes. Nevertheless, the, the seaside transit routes will always be there because boats can carry a huge load, uh, far faster, bigger load than any other air cargo or train shipment at this stage. Um, however, we do live at the age of climate change and the challenges and we do try to find sustainable ways to have, uh, you know, um, uh, protection of the environment and that is also a cost because on the one hand you've got governments which are signing for that and therefore are trying to limit the CO2 emission or the you know the or the footprint uh, however uh, you also need on the other side as I said you also have if you want the decision of, um, of, of countries to become even higher bigger consumer players in a global market economy and as I said, pan the global pandemic actually made this a reality and it boosted uh, the, the time frame in management. I, and I, I take it as, a, as, a, as an example in myself for the three months where we were locked in, we, we were only buying. We were only buying goods. So you can imagine the volume of buying things, how much discrepancy created uh, in the global supply chain market. Mm. And I think as well, um, you know, five years from now when hopefully 
uh, a lot of the most painful effects of COVID are in the past and we're turning to um, a new normal. Um, I think there's going to be uh, sustained changes in the logistics industry, particularly around automation and digitization. Um, so I, I noticed this a lot when I was um, writing the last couple of chapters of um, my book on this topic that came out um, last year. And we saw that um, the uptake of the industrial internet of things uh, combined with blockchain in um, uh, point by point verification, different supply chains uh, was sped up actually during, during COVID. Um, because a lot of the, the manual warehouse fulfillment operations were being completely automated, and that was a source of um, both cost savings and also risk um, risk reduction for for um, uh, for those operators. And um, I'm interested to see what the long term effect will be um, after uh, after COVID, uh, what, what what the new normal looks like that we settle into. I, I think this is a new normal right now. This is the new normal right now. You will not have a better new normal than what you have. My only fear is that the strain of COVID doesn't really stop the way that we were anticipating to stop. And you see, like big, you know, major, major, you know, players um, in global dialogue, if you want, against COVID, that they were saying, "Oh, by 23 it's going to finish." Now they say, "By 25 it's going to finish." Other people are saying, "By 28 it's going to finish." So I say, this is the new normal. My only problem, as I said, is that I will not be able to travel to come to Australia just like that, considering the, the you know, the, any time they can close. At any moment when I can fly, the night before, things can change, and then land in the airport and say, well, no, we've got, you've got to have these papers or these passes mm-hmm. or that level of vaccination. A very big, if you want, uh, question with regards to logistics, supply chain, and also the future of goods, including also the positioning of people as trade ambassadors, if you want, in those respective countries, has to do with the boosters also. We don't even know whether the boosters are actually a decision, a collective decision, uh, you know, through the World Health Organization and governments being involved with it. And then how do you transport those just single one good, you know, to, to that part of the world to make sure that everybody's is safe, well, and, and do the work. While at the same time, we're trying to, to be hybrid in nature. I mean, we are here now, um, um, uh, we're, we're connecting the dots throughout the world, and you now have a new a new normal, because these sort of, these sort of companies, um, they cannot stop from pro- being providers of services as the world need to go forward. But we need to look at the futuristic choices that we may have. Because, as I said, the, the, we're going to still be spending. We still have scarcity of, of, of primary sources. We will continue to have a scarcity of primary sources while we seek out for uh, alternatives. And it is of no wonder that, you know, looking out in space or looking out, as you said, in automation or uh, in various genetically you know, modified forms of producing something or printing even something uh, in a digitized form would actually be uh, not only the new normal, but the new normal is here and it is now. The question is what sort of quality of life we want to have uh, in an inclusive, if you want, market economy, in a digitized market economy. And these are the biggest questions that we can have. The post-COVID, during COVID or after COVID anymore, it's no longer um, an issue because we are living with COVID, whether we like it or not. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that... Like I said, I, I don't know. I don't know that events like COVID are, it's going to go away completely. Um, there's always going to be some new variant. There's always going to be some new virus. There's always going to be some new thing that pops up as the environment is damaged. More and more weird things happen all over the world, and because we're a global economy, whatever happens in the other part of the world can quickly travel to wherever you are, and. I don't. I don't see that changing at all. I don't. I don't see that that's going to get a, a better way. I think the only way we can have any sort of risk mitigation is, you know, I, I don't. Want, it's not a protectionist kind of thing, but I do think we have to meld technology with physical space because, yes, you can be very global with knowledge work and digital, but you can't be remote if it's in physical space. You can't remotely have somebody 
make you a burger. Someone has to actually cook it and bring it to your house. So there is still that last mile delivery. There is no way to get away from physical goods. So th th to, to say that it's all logistics and it's all computerized, it's not true. No matter, no matter how good your logistics are, the fact that I can get my food from five miles from my house or three miles from my house from a farm, rather than having a ship from Brazil to my local supermarket, it's just, it's not gonna be the same. And prices are gonna increase and I think they have to because otherwise no one will search for a local cheaper alternative. And I think there, there really is no way but to scroll it back. We can't just go completely global and source from wherever we want because I, I just, I don't see that that's gonna be sustainable going forward. There's just not enough resources. Plenty of countries have lots of money and they're all going for the same resources. Everybody wants resources of cobalt to make more silicon chips or whatever, but there's only so much of it. So it, it's going to be a problem going forward because there's just, that's just the way it's going to go. Mm. Mm. So we've got, we have about 10 minutes left on our panel and I um, wanted to just um, before we wrap up and as we wrap up, uh, touch on um, some more aspirational things. So, um, just want us to reflect, are there any things you would like to see happen in the industry, in the logistics and, and, um, and shipping industry um, in an ideal scenario over the next five years? Um, and in particular, if, if money was an issue and if, and if um, people could work together to resolve some of the um, endemic political um, issues as well, what, what would be the ideal scenario that you would like to see? Um, Maris, we'll go with you first. I've come, I've come to cherish very small things in life. For example, when I was a younger, a uh, young boy, uh, I remember my, my father had all sorts of tools that are actually very costly to buy them today for some reason. And I've been engaged in wanting to build my own garage with my own tools because you're not going to find them again, right? Uh, plus, the new generation of people, they don't know how to use their hands. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not saying that on a, on a, on a, on a degrading level, obviously, but they, they're, they're, they want to do more with regards to more, you know, globalized elements or to go around the world or build something that is really bigger than just a machine or an engine, let's say, or this and that. Whereas, in, in fact, when we were younger, we were only playing with engines. And we're testing itself, ourselves on everything. So now what you have is you have people ordering things so they know what to order. And as you said, you know, because of automation, you have robots since the 80s, but now pumped it up, you know, in the 90s and beginning of the 21st century, where actually things can be built on an order, right? So you don't know how it's built, but you know that there is a, a plan and they, they build it in the, in the project. So what I'm, what I'm actually going to say is it might be a bit revolutionary, but I think that eventually we're going to go back to the built-it-yourself policy. Um, the, the U.S. has this thing, and I think also, I presume also Australia has this, this mentality in the culture of building it yourself. But not everybody in this planet, I think, does. And that what actually um, is really interesting. If you tell me to choose to live in mega cities considering the, you know, the more options that you might have in the market or the more policy orientation that you have or the, the consumer needs. Because when you are in mega cities, the consumer needs are uh, greater, but at the same time, time is really imp more important because if a mega city wants to be a mega city, it will assure that it has a very huge port and a very good block, you know, a very good chain if you want of of um, of delivery goods within the, the city itself. But then again, if you want to talk about life and how you know, comfortable life you want to have, if you want to be in the outer skirts, let's say, not, not even close to the cities, and then it becomes a problem, then the opportunity will be stay with specific quality of goods, but then have a higher, if you want, quality of life away from this, if you want stress of mega cities, uh, and, and being there. So you, you pay something, you lose something. But then again, uh, as I said, I think we're going to go back to build it yourself. And I think more national economies uh, will be built on this capability uh, where government, on the one hand, will be inclusive to a digitized economy. But then again, they will be wanting to build their own goods at their own premises made in X country. 
So uh, and this will be eventually the competition versus the global good that will be offered at the same time. So there will be support of the government towards SMEs. How higher SMEs, as long as these uh, SMEs offer and are provided, if you want, the direct necessity to sell the good in the shelves, in a supermarket or whoever else, um, as a priority number one. So these goods will come number one in the national goods rather than, 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 the, than the global goods. Having said that, the global goods will be through e-commerce and through companies, large companies like Amazon. Uh, so it, it will be there. Um, and, you know, IKEA has has also made this this kind of policy quite clear when they, they rented everything, basically, in order to make sure that they deliver the, the quality of goods that they want to deliver. Um, I think if the future we can have anything we want, I believe we should have a decentralized supply system. Everything should be tracked on blockchain where we know the origin of wherever source, whatever item is being sourced, we can track it in real time. That is something we need. But if, if I'm, you know, like, like Mario said, I, I believe that in the future, everything will be dynamically priced or it should be dynamically priced. And I believe that time is actually more valuable than money. People that have money, they value time. And if that is the case, if we, if we move everything to a time-based economy, where you're monetizing the time of that vendor, that is where things will start to change. Because then you can dynamically price that time. That vendor will make more money in higher margins, and that's how they'll make more money. And that's, to me, that's the only way out of this whole conundrum, unless we just want to have Amazon and Ikea rule the world. So there's no mm. other way. I don't, I don't see there's another way that's possible to out of this situation. Mm. And that's interesting because, um, yeah, in, in my book, actually, I picked up that point and it, we spoke about how time is, in a sense, the universal currency. So that's really interesting to, to hear you um, say that. Let me, let me just add an, an example that would be really, like, astonishing. I, I, I know that where I come from, uh, I'm, I'm originally Greek. So, you know, my, my father has, he's coming from a very uh, small village um, back home. So outside our, our village house, we have uh, a tree, a lemon tree, right? And the lemon tree produces lemons and it's like just outside. Um, inside, th there is next, like in, in the same, let's say, quarter, there is a mini market, right? So you go to the mini market and I went to buy lemons. And those lemons were coming from a third country. And the lemons were so expensive in consideration that I, I turned and I said, listen, there is an all there's a there's a tree, a lemon tree just exactly outside my house. And you don't use that, but you bring it from a third and a fourth country. That's what I'm saying. You need to utilize your natural resources and your natural resources first and giving the opportunity to people to create their own market economy in order to be competitive in a global market uh, because we cannot we cannot afford not being globally competitive but small countries with small populations with no competition without mega cities they will not be able to survive the competition and therefore will, the goods themselves will become very expensive by the time they enter the country and therefore will be unbearable in the long term, people will seek for options if not if they're not seeking for options right now. So that's why I said that people are going to go back to build it yourself, buy it yourself, make it manufacture it yourself. Mm. All right. Well, that is um, uh, the, the end of our session has expired. So um, thank you again very much to Frank for um, inviting us to participate in this um, edition of Horasis. Um uh, I certainly look forward to participating again next year, hopefully in person. Um, and hopefully I can catch up with you gents at some point as well very soon. I look forward to that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you to both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, actually, just, just before you leave, let's get a, a group fee. Uh, here we go. So you should see an option to take a photo. Oh. <clears throat> okay, so that should be done. 
Fantastic. Nice. Great. All right. Well, have a fantastic um, uh, day, gentlemen. Uh, yeah, right. I'm, I might see you around if you're attending any, any other sessions. Otherwise, um, we'll keep in touch. Okay. Absolutely. Take care. Absolutely. Thank see you. Later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.